Well, thank you. Now let me tell you what it's all about. Um, so far as I can gather, Ibsen wrote uh, his play, Peer Gint, not simply to amuse people, but to drive home a message. And it was a message on uh, what one might term man in search of his soul. In order to do this, uh, Ibsen actually uh, did quite a deal of research into the folklore of his country and did discover that there was a man who actually lived around about the year 1800 with the name Peer Gint. Peer, by the way, is just the common Norwegian name equivalent to Peter. And Peter Gint is introduced, or Peer Gint is introduced on the stage at the very beginning as a, a wastrel son of a spendthrift father who had a farm. The father had died and the son was altogether too lazy to look after it and uh, his mother simply scolded him but spoiled him. And Peer Gint is the perfect example of the man who simply lives for himself and never thinks the thing about anybody else. He went off to a wedding and it was there that he met for the first time Solvig. And Solvig was the one person apparently who had any power to pull something better out of the wastrel. Solvig apparently represents the appeal of eternity to a man. Even more explicitly, the appeal of religion. By the way, Ibsen wouldn't have made it more explicit than that. He was not a Christian, but he was a highly moral man. But at this same wedding, uh, Pierre Gint, in a fit of uh, uh, sudden, uh, I shall say, enthusiasm, <laughs> seized the bride and made off with her to the mountains. And uh, there they stayed for a while until he got tired of her and sent her packing. But this meant that he was an outlaw. He couldn't go back home. And so in his wanderings, he found his way into the caves where the trolls lived. Now, uh, I played you what was called the Dance of the Gnomes. The trolls are sort of gnomes, uh, half human, half beast. And as uh, far as uh, Ibsen really was concerned, when he pictured Peer Gint amongst the uh, the trolls, he was thinking of humanity on its bestial side. And amongst these, Peer was very well at home. He was taken along to the king of the trolls, actually, and uh, it was suggested, indeed, that he might marry her daughter, his daughter. Uh, the daughter of the king was an appallingly ugly woman, uh, as indeed trolls generally are, but nevertheless... Uh, I mean, Pierre hadn't got any place out where the mortals were, and to be the son of the king and the heir to the throne was worth even marrying Ingrid. And so he agreed to marry her. Uh, he, it was explained that if he was to do this, there were one or two conditions. The prime one being this, that he must keep the first law of the trolls, which was simply to live to yourself. Well, Peer had never done anything else in any case, but to be told that this was the major law of existence amongst the trolls just suited him fine. Out there, says the king, they say something like, man to yourself be true. Here, you simply have to say to yourself, be enough. Uh, and so that was splendid. They provided Peer with a tail, and uh, so he settled down. But uh, not too successfully, and this was observed by the king. And he said, you know, there's something wrong with you. You just allow me to put some cuts in your eyes so that you can't see straight, and then you'll be all right among us. But at this period objected. It was one thing, of course, just to settle down amongst these half-bestial sort of creatures, but uh, to be unable to see straight ever afterwards was a price he wasn't prepared to pay. And he fled of course, it was pretty clear that Ibsen was wanting to say that there is a limit to which any man is prepared to red-hot iron, as it were, his conscience. 
He had managed to escape them, but he got into some dark cavern, and then in front of him there was some horribly cold, clammy creature. And he started back in terror and tried to find another way, and the cold, clammy monster was in front of him. Whenever he went, this horrible thing in the dark was there. Actually, it's a, a mythological creature called by the Norwegians the Borg, a horrible monster in the dark. But in his terror, Pierre called out, Who are you? And the voice came back, I am yourself. A very telling illustration in the play. A man may run away from his companions. He may run away from the beasts. But he cannot escape himself. And he was the real monster. Actually, Piergin did manage to escape only because at the crucial moment the church bells sounded and the sound of the psalms being sung came through and Solvig's prayer was being heard. And he found his way back to Solvig and she was prepared to live with him. So they decided that they would live in the forest. But of course, it's, uh, it's a bit difficult to settle down with religion when you've been having a fair time in life. And the blood's still coursing in your veins, and this was too quiet an existence for Pierre, and he ran away. He ran away, and in fact, you must remember, of course, this was written in Norway. Guess where he came? He came to the USA. <laughs> and he rapidly became a millionaire. And he had two sources of income. I remember right, the couplet runs selling images to China and slaves to Carolina. Uh, Mark Yu, he was a bit concerned about this because every now and again he got a bit of a twinge of conscience and he remembered that there was something he'd heard as a boy about the last judgment. And so he had a bright idea. He paid for some missionaries to go to China so that uh, the rate of the conversions and the baptisms would keep pace with the increase of the selling of the idols and trade was good and sold his conscience. It's the most wonderful, actually, passage in the book to see how Pierre sold his conscience by paying for missionaries while he supplied the idols for temptation. Well, uh, I'll have to speed by and let you know what happened. Pierre actually began to let his fantasy go wild and conceived a plan of becoming emperor of the world. The madness of his success, you see, intoxicated him. I'll tell you where he ended up. When it was discovered as to what his ambitions were, they put him in the madhouse. And there is a most appalling scene of Pierre in the asylum in Cairo. Somebody asks him for some string and he manages to find a big rope and the man promptly went and hanged himself. Uh, somebody s said he was a pencil and asked Pierre if he'd got a knife. He wanted to sharpen himself. So Pierre obliged and the man promptly cuts his throat. And you stick a mess on the, uh, uh, on, on, on the platform. It's, 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 it's a most grotesque thing. But the whole thing heads up to that when they discover that Pierre had got the idea that he was the emperor of the world, well, they crowned him king because he was king of the madhouse. Nobody was as mad as he was. Uh, the, the emperor of himself. The comment is needless. In the end, Pierre thought he'd better pack this lark up, and he decided to go home. He'd made a good deal of money, and lost a good deal of money, by the way, and that was a story in itself. But, alas, as the boat was nearing his native land, a storm came, and the ship went down. Pierre just managed to escape with one other man in a boat, and incidentally, as they swam to the boat, you, there's a scene in which Pierre pushes the fellow down under the water so that he manages to get in the boat himself alone and be sure that he's all right, and he gets to land safely, but penniless. And an old man come home, misspent his years, and there's nothing to show, and nobody remembers 
Peergint. He trudges in the mountains and then he's met by a most peculiar figure. Are you Peergint? asked this man. He said, yes, and who are you? I'm the button man, came the reply. You were a button on the coat of the world, but your loop gave way. And uh, my master doesn't waste anything, so I've come to melt you down. And Peer was horrified. Melt me down and become nothing? You can't do that. And then a classic reply is given. My dear Peer, why all the fuss over a technical point like this? Yourself is what you've never been. He says you'll meet him at the next crossroads. And eventually the terrible truth strikes this man. Yourself is what you'd never been. He'd never allowed the man he ought to have been to live at all. He was a lie, a falsehood. And he's overwhelmed with repentance pleads that he might stand on the mountain top and stare at the promised land in the light of the setting sun and that he might be allowed to die and be covered with a heap of stones with the epitaph over him here lies the man that never was In the end, in fact, what happened was, as the button man did meet him to take him away, he discovered he was near a house and there was the sound of singing. It was so vague. An old, old lady still praying for him. And he flies to her. And she embraces him and tells him the, the thing he's yearned to know for so long. Where have I been? all these years and she says in my faith in my hope in my love and that's the end it's the closest parallel I have ever read to the story of the prodigal son the chief difference being that he returns to his senses in his old old age too late to be of any use. He's a wonderful illustration of a greater teacher than Ibsen who said, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose what Peer Gint lost? His life. His soul. Actually, Ibsen does make it quite clear. He has an answer. But it is a Spartan answer. And it is that a man must slay himself. It is an acute form of self-denial that a man may find life. Again, extraordinarily close to Jesus, except that. Ibsen couldn't know or understand this. Before a man and do that sort of thing with himself, he needs redemption. Somebody who has died for him. And that word grace, which is so characteristic of our faith, to enable a man to be what he would be, to find the way home. Not when it's too late, but in life that he may taste life. It's a wonderful story. It's not copyright, by the way. Gladly let you use it, any of you preachers. Read the play for yourself. <laughs> You'll be able to get a very great deal out of it. Um, let's, however, remember the lesson I'm sure Ibsen would wish us to do. And when we hear the music again, remember the story. And let's see that we truly live by the grace of God. I think it would be fitting, if you don't mind, if we closed with prayer. Our Lord and our God, 
As we're gathered here in this place tonight, we thank you first for the gifts of life that give to us beauty amidst the ordinary affairs of life. And we thank you in particular for the loveliness of music, the genius of men that enable us to enjoy it, and above all for the reminder that it all comes from the Lord of beauty, love, and grace. And so we want to thank you for this tonight. We thank you for the reminder, too, amidst the beauty of the music, of the importance of finding the giver as well as enjoying the gift. And we pray that even as you've given us grace to find you, so you will help us to help others to find the same path. And so prepare us for tomorrow. And as we go, some of us, to mix among men and women to help them understand too, give to us our heart of love and words of grace to communicate the loveliest message of all. And may the grace of Jesus abide with us. Amen.